in humanitarian assistance, uh, this is a huge benefit if you can draw on all different specialities because you have issues that are so complex and that are actually driven by very many different factors in our societies that are producing the disasters but also preventing actual emergency work to happen. It's about politics, it's about medicine, it's about demographics, it's about climate change, it's about development policy, whatever. You can actually not do humanitarian assistance with your good heart. You need brain, you need organization, you need uh, rules of engagement, you need to have deep knowledge about law and uh, organization. Uh, uh, organizational capacities. Everything actually is needed in order to service the victims because it's so easy to make mistakes. And we have the no harm, do no harm principle. If you go in and you have food aid and suddenly you attract uh, mafioso type people uh, with Kalashnikovs and they, they round up uh, the women that have the food. I mean, you have done more harm than you have actually done good because you have perpetuated a situation which you were supposed actually to correct. So it's, it's, it's really about professionalism. It's about knowing what you do, having a good piece of analysis up front, and actually cooperating across the different boundaries of our professional uh, specialties. So <clears throat> I am heading this uh, eco business, and uh, we are part of a huge family of donors uh, and also operators across the world. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, we are quite big in the big scheme of things. As a donor, uh, we are about the second or the third biggest uh, after the Americans. If you add on the assistance provided by all of your member states of the European Union, the European Union is actually the biggest operator out there, a little bit uh, beyond the Americans. Uh, but it varies. It's very close. And then shortly after that, you have the Japanese, uh, uh, you have the Norwegians uh, uh, that are not members of the EU. Uh, shame on them, but maybe they will come one day. I hope they come before the oil runs out, but uh, we'll see. Uh, so uh, you have the Swiss, uh, you have the Canadians, and uh, then you have occasionally some donors that are outside of the system, like the Saudi Arabians, like Qatar, uh, like Brazil. I'm trying to build up a good relationship with people in Brazil. There's somebody with a link here with Brazil. Is that you? Okay, you see? Yeah. So I'm good terms with, with, with your government and trying to bring them in to the family of humanitarian actors. Because actually we can see that compared to the needs that are skyrocketing, the funding is sort of reaching a ceiling. It's very, very difficult to raise the extra dollar or the extra euro every time we have a crisis. This is our mandate, which is the shortest version I could put it on. Basically, what we are dealing with in, uh, in uh, DG ECHO, which stands for Director General for European Commission's uh, Humanitarian Office, and somebody invented ECHO. You know, nobody really knows what it means, but we know it. And we tried, we tried actually to change the name, but the, the staff were so upset because they thought that this name was their property, so they kept it and so on. So I said, okay, we, we keep that. And in the world of humanitarians, ECHO is quite well known as a brand, as a, as a sign of quality and, and relatively good work. I'll come to that in a second. So we deal with natural disasters, but also man-made. So we are both in civil war situations, conflicts, ethnic uh, uh, infighting and so on, but we are also in uh, uh, earthquakes, we are also in drought situations, nutrition, uh, all climate change related uh, disasters all across uh, the world. And uh, <clears throat> we are both active in third countries outside of the Union with humanitarian assistance. It actually exclusively can be given outside the Union. But the civil protection arm, which is something very new that has been added to ECHO, which are you know, coordination of firefighters, coordination of radiological experts, if you have a Fukushima accident and so on, uh, seismologists, uh, all these kind of specialized guys, that has been added to the humanitarian portfolio. So I have a double, I actually have a double hat, a humanitarian hat and a civil protection hat. And the civil protection guys, 
and girls, they can be active inside the union as well. This is um, how it looks uh, seen a little bit from Brussels. We have the Emergency Response Coordination Center, which is actually a kind of state of the art. It's uh, five or six times the size of this room. It's a uh, smack full of, of TV monitors, uh, computer links, uh, whatever. We are linked up to each of the uh, emergency response centers in Europe. And we also have uh, all kinds of facilities to link up uh, over satellite to all our field offices uh, all across the world. So it's really a hub. It was opened last year, uh, and we're using it now full time because it's the most efficient uh, support platform for international coordination right now. And they <coughs> coordinate human, humanitarian assistance and civil protection. They coordinate also, talking about Ebola, we have our uh, Director General for Health, Public Health, Sanko, and they are, of course, coming to us, and we have all the doctors, and we coordinate with the ECDC in Stockholm, the Infectious Disease uh, Center up there, and the WHO. So as we speak, I mean, actually, at 3 o'clock, there will be a video conference and a teleconference, uh, because some places, they don't have the facilities, so they are just hooked up by phone. And, and we have Geneva, New York, Washington, uh, DFID in London, WHO in Geneva, plus ECDC in Stockholm, and DG Sanko, uh, our own health experts, plus our logisticians, to look at what is going on. Plus, by the way, Eurocontrol, <laughs> would you believe, uh, the, uh, the uh, airplane uh, uh, command center in Brussels, because one of the uh, complicating factors is that we risk having a, a flight ban imposed in these countries, which in itself is a problem, but for humanitarian workers, it's a really worrisome signal, because if suddenly they get sick, we cannot perform a medical evacuation, because we can't get the airplane in. So it's, it's full of technicalities that you have to take care of and actually try to coordinate, and that's why the center is pretty good. So, um, yeah, I spoke to you about the 24-7. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's up and running. Uh, and we have the coordination hub. Um, we have also, it's important to understand that we also uh, interact very, very active with the Foreign Service. I mean, the European Union's uh, sort of State Department, the diplomats, the military guys, the intelligence guys, because uh, we need to know what happens also on the political side in order to judge whether it's safe to go in, not safe to go in, et cetera, et cetera. Here you have a little bit, uh, some uh, figures on needs, and uh, uh, suffice to say that everything you see is just going up, up, up. And um, I mean, the only thing that doesn't go up is the number of earthquakes, because that's, that's actually something that has nothing to do with either climate change or politics or uh, whatever, but all the other things are moving up. It's about climate change, it's about demographics. I mean, more people, more people affected. Uh, more people, more urbanization. More people, more people living in floodplains or near the coast where you have hurricanes like Haiyan in the Philippines and places like that. So, um, difficult. More people, more political tension. In particular, after the end of the Cold War, you can see that, that the, 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 the lid has been lifted off the, 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 the cooker and the, it's exploding all over the place because the, we, we haven't yet found the new political equilibrium and then people are cutting each other's throat. So it's, uh, it's, really, it's really heavy and, um, and uh, complicated to deal with. More uh, IDPs, I mean, uh, more internally displaced people. People that are chased around inside their own country. Not to speak about refugees, they are also on the increase. So uh, UNHCR, these people, uh, they have a big, big job to, to deal with. More, um, in particular in Latin America, Central America, I would say, more what is called other forms of violence, which goes unnoticed under the radar screen. I'm talking about urban crime, where gangs are just roaming around, killing people, 
uh, wrecking the school system, uh, wrecking the, the water supply, electricity, and so on and so forth. That's a caseload we have not really understood. Of course, if you are just a little bit intelligent and you see the numbers of increased caseload, and we live in an economic crisis where it's difficult to raise money, then you start thinking, hey, how can we cope? And the natural conclusion of that is if we are better at preventing things from happening, then perhaps we stand a chance. Of course, then the question comes, how, <clears throat> how do you do, I mean, do you move money from life-saving to prevention? That's a heavy responsibility. Take away money from a nutrition center and you put it into sustainable agriculture. That's perhaps not exactly the way to do it. But definitely you would want to make sure that the development money that is there is not used to build big tourist facilities, but perhaps used to build sustainable agriculture. Because that's, risk, that's linked to your vulnerability analysis. You see what I mean? So this kind of preventive thinking, disaster risk reduction, <clears throat> resilience, how do you improve the capacity of the local communities to actually lift themselves up by the hair and get out through their own means of a disaster situation, doing the repair work, doing the political work of building peace or whatever? How do you, how do, you do that? It's not done by just building motorways or sewage uh, uh, plants and so on. You need, you need specific societal change. So this whole reflection on prevention is increasingly gaining ground because everybody have understood that we don't have enough money to actually just save the lives at the end of the pipeline. The most important thing there, in my view, is to get to a common vulnerability analysis. Because you will see, you will see in your group that the more you talk to each other, the more you will actually understand each other and your mind will home in on some common analysis and some common understanding. If you take a development guy and a humanitarian guy and a political guy and uh, maybe a nutritionist and maybe a human rights person and you just dump them somewhere and ask them to come up with solutions, they will never agree on where to put the money. But if you dump them and ask them to make a common vulnerability analysis before they design the action, then you have a chance of actually getting something done that is more meaningful. The, the whole notion of fragile states comes from there. The, the, the development guys have understood that they pour in money and money and money, and they build very nice things, and then suddenly, it's just blown away because you have civil war or you have a, 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 a meteorological disaster or you have some kind of other accident or epidemics like Ebola, which can ruin the economic growth of the whole western coast of, of Africa. And if you, so if you have not factored in vulnerability, you, you lose your investment. It's a very lousy investment you do. So you need this vulnerability in order to reach what I would call resilience, which actually means that the societies have a capacity to, 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 it's like a shock absorber. They can cope with it and then bounce back. A lot of calculations have been made on the uh, benefits of investing in prevention. And basically, sort of uh, on the back of an envelope calculations made by the World Bank and the uh, IMF and the uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, they say that $1 invested in prevention saves you $7 in actual emergency aid. That's the ballpark figure. It's, it's full of statistics uh, and, and uncertainty, but this is more or less what, what, we, uh, what we talk about. I think it's very important to explain to our colleagues from different disciplines that our principles are actually important seen from an operational point of view. Because if you take position in a complex conflict and you want to come in and help the oppressed and you have a political message, then your 
emergency workers will not reach the victims. They are simply going to be blocked. So better be careful. If you want to go and, and make uh, 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 prison visits uh, in, uh, in Assad's prisons in Aleppo or in Homs or wherever, you better not speak too much against Assad before you go in, because he's not just not going to allow you to go in, right? He's maybe not going to allow you anyhow, because what happens in these prisons is fairly atrocious. But if you want to do humanitarian work, you have to be very, very careful with how you express views about the political situation. So it's, it's a very heavy responsibility as a humanitarian to venture into the political discussion. And it's very difficult to keep your mouth shut when you see violations. It, it's really, you know, hello. But if you want to do human rights work, you have to go to another NGO. Just change. Go over to Human Rights Watch. Or go over to work for, for, for some other organizations. There are many, Amnesty International and so on. Don't stay as a humanitarian. Because we should just not. We know, we see, we use the knowledge in the way we design our programs. But we don't express it as a political process. That's too dangerous. One of the big problems we have had in Syria has been that we had something called the Friends of Syria, FOS. The Friends of Syria were basically a group of countries that wanted to kick out Assad. And when they had difficulties in doing that for a number of reasons, then they started doing humanitarian work. Don't do it. If you want me to work with the Friends of Syria, I would be kicked out of Damascus. I would be kicked out of Homs. I would not be able to operate. I won't be able to do a cross line. I won't be able to get the trucks in. And they will make difficulties for the uh, World Food Program. They will make difficulties for the International Red Cross. They will make difficulties for, because they will say that these guys from ECHO, they are actually instrumentalized by the Friends of Syria. So I created, together with <coughs> Valerie Amos, uh, a different track. We tried to put it out of the politics. And we created a Syrian humanitarian forum, where we said, here we discuss only the humanitarian nature of the disaster. And I would want to have in the Russians, the Qataris, the Iranians, uh, all the others, and we just focus on the needs of people, the health problems, the nutrition problem, because on that, in most cultures, you have an obligation to help. So this, is, this was the starting point of a very long, awful process where I tried to keep the politics out. The politics was somewhere else, and we just focused on this. And had we not done it, then I'm fairly sure <clears throat> that you would not have had today a UN resolution allowing cross-border deliveries of humanitarian assistance into Syria from the north, which is part, was part of the challenge, that we have big, big areas in Syria under control, sometimes by the government, sometimes by the rebels, sometimes God knows whom, but they were shooting. And you couldn't get help in, not only because it was insecure, but also because one party or the other party thought that it was a political operation. In Iraq, <coughs> you have a similar situation right now, where you have the ISIS guys uh, coming uh, over taking possession, chasing the, uh, what are they called, the Yaziris up in the mountain in, in the, uh, the north-west. Uh, north, uh, and, and, and you see, just right in front of you, you see this dilemma of bringing in the military, making airdrops, of course, because we want to save the people. But if you send in a helicopter, the people uh, from the rebellion, they don't know if it's a military helicopter with machine guns, or if it's actually a humanitarian helicopter with food stuff. And next time a helicopter comes, they may shoot without asking. So how do you deal with that? That's why we have the protocols. That's why we say, OK, if military assets are used, they have to be clearly identified. They have to warn the people on the ground that they come in with a humanitarian purpose. But uh, I'm, I'm concerned that 
the way we act now in North Iraq is actually going to pose a lot of problems for the humanitarians for the future. We have been there before, we have seen it, it has happened many times. Same stuff <coughs> in Afghanistan, and you all know the story about the, about the uh, UNICEF uh, doctor that uh, went in and took a DNA tests uh, to find bin Laden under the uh, under a humanitarian umbrella, which actually meant that uh, 2,000 doctors were kicked out. And suddenly you have a collapse of the communal health system in parts of North Pakistan. I'm not saying that you should forbid necessarily the CIA uh, or the Deuxième Bureau or our Secret Service uh, to work, fine, but we just have to be very clear that it comes at a cost. And if they do that, then UNICEF cannot work in that area for very many years. So it's super dangerous. Myanmar, <clears throat> this is one of the uh, actions where I think we have really been uh, working very, very hard uh, in Kashid and Karen. I mean, in the, if you have Myanmar and you look to the border to Thailand and to China, there have been uh, uh, rebel movements going on for quite some time. And uh, the EU has created a peace forum and have brought in the people there, giving them support, education and so on, to actually try to determine a way out of the crisis. It's working very, very well, I have to say. The one place where it doesn't work is Rakhine. Rakhine is over in the other end of the country, towards Bangladesh. So you have a huge Muslim minority that basically is put in concentration camps. It's awful. I mean, I've been there. I've been in the camps. And what you see there, you just... <clears throat> like, they cut... I mean, it's, it's 40 degrees outside. They cut the water supply. And what, what is happening when you cut the water supply to a camp with uh, 20,000 people? I mean, it's, uh, it's really heavy stuff. So we are trying to, <clears throat> there I'm trying to work with the Americans, but also with our, with our diplomats, to see if uh, we cannot get this issue, because I think you need a political approach here. You need to get this Rakhine issue off the table of the elections that are coming up. Because the reason why they cannot cope with that is that the Buddhist majority is getting so excited about the Muslims, and they are getting so nationalistic that for Aung San Suu Kyi and for the government, it's very dangerous to say that they want to help them. Then they're going to lose votes next time. So how do you deal with that? How do you foster a dialogue between the different parties so that the politicians can say at least, okay, they are talking, so we don't need to have an opinion? It's really the art of the second best. How do you calibrate your political action and so on? We want to know what is going on. On the other hand, when politicians don't have solutions, then they very often find humanitarian assistance very attractive because we are seen as doing something, which actually is counterproductive. So there's a whole philosophy being developed, which is called the comprehensive approach. In the UN system, you have it, the whole of state, there are different concepts that are actually quite similar where you look at all the different components of policy. And the trick here, of course, is that when the humanitarians go into that, you, re you protect your capacity to operate independently because you cannot be part of a political plan. You have to be seen as being outside of that. But of course you are in, because as I told you, I need the intelligence, I need sometimes military support, I need logistics, I need money, I need capacity, and so on. So this is the whole discussion about being in but out, where we can actually tell them a lot of the difficult things that are happening, but we can also please ask them to preserve our neutrality, now, I spoke to you in the beginning, and I think that will be uh, the last few slides, about how to make decisions about allocation of funds. And this is not improvisation. It is scientific. 
and we let the numbers speak, the level of malnutrition, the risk of epidemics, the level of conflict in the different uh, cities or rural districts and so on, um, the, the presence of other donors. If nobody is taking care, then we have, ECHO has a policy that we want to deal with a number of forgotten crises. We don't want to be driven by the CNN uh, effect, that it's just the rolling cameras, but we want to be with the Naxalites. Who, who, who knows who the Naxalites are? You see, it's forgotten. It's about uh, two million people in India with nutrition rates rock bottom. It's one of the hugest famine-oriented caseloads in the world, and it's not spoken about, but we are there because it's a policy commitment.